Hi everyone. My name is Mo Weinheim and I'm a Dharma teacher in the Empty Moon Zen Sangha. Today I'd like to explore a short excerpt from Hakuin Ekaku's Song of Zazen. All beings by nature are Buddha, as ice by nature is water. Apart from water, there is no ice. Apart from beings, no Buddha. How sad that people ignore the near and search for truth afar. Like someone in the midst of water crying out in thirst. Like a child of a wealthy home wandering among the poor. Truly, is anything missing now? Nirvana is right here before our eyes. This very place is the Lotus Land. This very body, the Buddha. I had a remarkable moment recently. It was one of those perfect moments where everything seems just right. It was the weekend and I'd been able to sleep in just a little bit. There were these soft beams of sunlight streaming in from the window, creating this lovely glow in the room. And I even had a gentle breeze on my face from our fan. I was in a soft, warm bed, cuddling with my partner, the love of my life. Our kitty jumped up, purring and headbutting my hand, which is her way of asking for pets. It was one of those moments of pure harmony where everything felt complete. One of those perfect moments. Nirvana truly was right here before my eyes. I'm sure all of you at some point have this moment of harmony. It may look very different from the one I just described, but an experience, however brief, where everything felt complete. And, and Hakuin's Song of Zazen is definitely not just referring to moments of tranquility, ease, comfort, contentment, or joy. Far from it. Hakuin Ekaku was a great Zen master who was born in the late 17th century. He was one of the most influential teachers in Japanese Zen, known for his paintings, calligraphy, and for revitalizing the Rinzai school at a time where its very survival was in question. He accomplished this by helping people return to the basics of Zazen, seated meditation, and koan study. Very briefly, in case you haven't encountered koan study before, koans are documented questions or interactions between Zen masters and students over the centuries. Each one points to something important along the Zen way. They're typically presented as short stories or anecdotes, which Robert Aiken Roshi, a venerable elder of the Western Zen way, suggested are matters to be made clear. In fact, the koan that Hakuin is likely known best for is, what is the sound of one hand? As he says, this very place is the lotus land, this very body is the Buddha. For much of my life, it's been hard to believe that this could be true. It's easy to feel all right, maybe even optimistic about the world when things are going well. But what about when they aren't? What about when life throws curveballs that cut us to the quick, bring us to our knees, or leave us feeling defeated? It can be a lot easier to connect with Hakuin's words when things feel harmonious, or at least when they feel like they're leaning in that general direction. But as a Zen master, his meaning is clear. He is not picking and choosing. He is pointing directly at the mess, the muck, the whole of human experience and inviting, nay, downright challenging us to examine each moment in fullness and saying, asking, truly, is anything missing now? Well, what about during a fight with someone we care about or excruciating uncertainty while waiting to hear important news? What about when we feel sick or depleted or even just stubbing your toe or biting your lip in the same spot for three days in a row? 
it makes me wish for some wild variation of that that scene with Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars. This is not the nirvana you're looking for. And yet, suspending disbelief for just a moment, let's entertain the possibility that Hakuin is correct. That nirvana is right here before our eyes, stub toes and all. What is he really pointing to? I had a bad day the other week. I got into an argument with one of my family members. Both of us were frustrated in a very me-centric experience of reality, and we kept missing each other somehow. And the harder I tried to fix what I thought the issues were, the worse things actually seemed to get. The tension was awful, and I just wanted it to stop. I wanted to solve the problem, get to the part where we could meet on equal ground, and move on. I wanted the relief of resolution and understanding. What I later realized was that my desire to resolve the tension around what I perceived the problems to be, this desire to push to a faster outcome was actually part of the problem. It meant that I wasn't present with the conflict. I wasn't honoring the tension. I had too many opinions and ideas about what was going on. Well, correction, it's not that I had too many opinions and ideas about what was happening. It was that I was automatically believing them to be true. Reflecting on this afterwards reminded me of an old Zen story called Empty Your Cup. This story is often attributed to a famous conversation between the scholar Poksan and Zen master Ryotan in the ninth century. One day, the highly educated scholar Poksan, who was full of knowledge and opinions about the Dharma, came to master Ryotan to have tea and ask about Zen. At one point, when master Ryotan refilled his guest's teacup, he didn't stop pouring when the cup was full. The tea overflowed from Toksan's cup, spilling out and running over the table. Stop, said Toksan. <laughs> the cup is full. Exactly, said Master Ryotan. You are like this cup. You are full of ideas. You come and ask for teaching, but your cup is full. I can't put anything in. You, you have to empty your cup. For me, Master Ryotan represents the tension in the argument I was referring to. I had so many ideas and opinions about what was going on, there was no room for presence and curiosity. There was no spaciousness for the tension to show or teach me anything. My cup was already full. What I took away from this was the importance of holding and honoring tension when tension is what's before me or within me. The importance of knowing when to let it be, of returning to my breath. My first impulse is so often to try and solve a problem, like to get to the bottom of what's wrong and to fix it. And while that's a tremendously uh, like helpful skill to have, I've discovered again and again that there are times when it's actually more skillful and less harmful to not push to solve a problem right away just because it's uncomfortable, just because it hurts or isn't going the way I want it to. Instead of trying to rush toward resolution, there's something to be said for emptying my cup of the ideas or opinions that feel so true in the moment and instead be viscerally present with the experience of just this discomfort, just this anger, hurt, or uncertainty, and to get stronger here, honoring the tension, even when I wish it were otherwise. How sad that people ignore the near and search for truth afar like someone in the midst of water crying out in thirst. 
I don't want to ignore the near in principle, but in everyday life, I have to admit sometimes the near is too much to bear. And instead, I put on the armor of my ideas, opinions, and drive to problem solve. Sometimes getting stronger here is beyond me. As Master Mumon says, commenting on the famous Mu Kong, it can feel like drinking a hot iron ball that I can neither swallow nor spit out. Just this past I co-facilitated a monthly preset discussion that included a creative writing exercise we've never tried before. We invited participants to choose one of the 16 bodhisattva precepts, one that they wished to know, like get to know a little better, and to create a doodled representation of it, imagining the precept as a concrete being that they could have a written dialogue with. One Sangha member chose to engage the ninth grade precept, worded as actualize harmony, do not indulge in anger. They generously shared their doodle of this precept with the group, which looked something like this. I've tried to do it justice. This depiction of actualizing harmony really struck a chord with me. The dollop of white within the black and the dollop of black within the white is a variation of the yin and yang symbol. But this is unique. To me, where the yin and yang symbol falls short is how it so cleanly represents harmony, which, believe it or not, I find somewhat misleading. How do we harmonize with something that's painful or uncomfortable? To me, this representation of actualizing harmony is on point. The lines between the two spheres can be seen in different ways, either being pulled apart, stretched beyond measure as the spheres move in opposite directions, or embracing one another more closely together. It's a wonderful way to portray harmony within tension, conflict within balance. In the words of Josh Bartok, Roshi of the Greater Boston Zen Center, I value the perspective that includes brokenness as part of wholeness, suffering as part of freedom, and death as part of life. Each breath we draw brings with it new opportunities to practice, an opportunity to practice imperfectly, to do our best, to honor the tensions in our lives. Not too long ago, I came across the chant we say together before breakfast and lunch while on sashin, or retreat, the Oriyoki meal chant. And while it typically asks that we reflect on the effort that brought us our food, in light of Hakuin's Song of Zazen, I made a slight modification I'd like to share. Here's how it goes. We reflect on the effort that brought us this moment and consider how it comes to us. We reflect on our virtue and practice and whether we are worthy of this offering. We regard greed as the obstacle to freedom of mind. We regard this moment as medicine to sustain our life. For the sake of awakening, we now receive this time. As human beings, we have this unique opportunity to cultivate intention in our lives, to reflect ever more deeply, and to explore together what it means to live with grace. Messy, tangled, difficult, vibrant lives of grace. That's why Zen is so often referred to as practice. It's very much a verb where the destination is 100% the journey itself. Truly, is anything missing now? Nirvana is right here before our eyes. This very place is the Lotus Land. This very body, the Buddha. Thank you.